Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the seventh webinar in our 2021 series. My name is Brian Harper, and I'm the Director of Communications. At We're glad you could join us this afternoon. Go ahead and post in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. As with all of our webinars, we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of this one. So please post your questions in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on it, so go ahead and post them as they come to you. Note that if you're watching this on the events page of dan.org, you won't be able to post questions. So in that case, you can look at the bottom left corner of the embedded video player, click the YouTube logo, and go to Dan's YouTube page where you'll be able to post questions. All right, let me introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Francois Berman is the Director of Risk Mitigation at Dan. He is responsible for all Dan's safety and accident prevention initiatives, as well as the Recompression Chamber Network. He has traveled around the world to conduct safety assessments at facilities used to treat injured divers and has written two books, The Risk Assessment Guide for Dive Operators and Professionals and The Risk Assessment Guide for Recompression Chamber Facilities. Today's topic is a Q&A session with Dan Safety Services. And without further ado, I'll get right into our first question. So Francois, Thanks for being here with us this afternoon. You're welcome. Uh, having read horror stories of live aboard fires in recent times, what can I, as an avid but conservative diver, do to help protect myself from being trapped below decks of a boat? Well, it must be a pretty frightening uh, event for you to go through, and we've seen two relatively recent events. But I need to couch that by saying we have hundreds of thousands of, of boat trips in a year, and it's really every few years perhaps that we have an issue and very rarely that we have a catastrophic one. However, I think the events of the past have led to us investigating this a bit further. And what I'd like to share with you uh, this afternoon is some of the things that you can do, consider, perhaps prepare for, uh, so that when you go on your expensive or let's say your long saved up for cruise, liveaboard cruise, you can be at least assured that you're not going to be one of those very unfortunate statistics that we've seen or that we've heard about. Okay, so what can you do before you go? And clearly the key is to be prepared, to understand what it is that you are going to expose yourself to and try to, before you actually go on your vacation, think about it. Don't be overly concerned in terms of what we've said in history, but get yourself ready to face some of the realities. Right at the top of this is to do what we very rarely do, and that is to pay attention to the actual safety briefings. Um, and in fact, if the dive boat doesn't give you one, you should insist on one. Your safety ultimately is your responsibility. You may try and pass that on to others, but that doesn't help you in the time of an accident. And then you probably want to find out, if, especially if you're going to be uh, in a cabin below decks, you want to make sure that they explain to you what the fire drill is, and in fact, probably better that you actually do a walkthrough, make sure that you're familiar with where the exits are, and that you know where the, the equipment is that's going to protect you, like the fire extinguishers, and the alarms, because sometimes they're going to be located in areas where you might not logically think that they would be. So really important that you are familiar with um, what you're going to do if there's going to be a fire on board. As important as man overboard or the, you know, the boat capsizing or sinking, we need to have some basic preparation in place. And the US Coast Guard is pretty insistent about some of these drills too. Okay, so that's, that's what you can do when you're board in preparation uh, for your cruise. And then if you are going to have a cabin below the decks, then you probably want to take a couple of things with you to really avoid those unfortunate situations that we've seen happen. A couple of relatively inexpensive items to take with you, are perhaps starting with a portable carbon monoxide monitor or a smoke detector. We're pretty used to these in our houses these days. And all we really want to do is make sure that the batteries are installed, that you've tested it, and that it's relatively sensitive. And that's going to give you an indication not only of a fire, but perhaps exhaust leaking from the diesel engines and other sources of carbon monoxide. But you want to know about a fire long before it gets hot and fast and dangerous for you. And then if you are going to be in an area where it's difficult to get up or perhaps it will take time to get up onto the deck, then a small fold up um, smoke hood, as we call it, might be something to consider. Um, they relatively easy to put on. You just perhaps need to read the instructions before you go. And they will give you at least 15 minutes of clean air that you can then make sure that you can get out, get onto the deck and report to your master stations. 
And then something else that um, we advise you to think about, and you know, if you assume that there's an emergency or you hear there's an emergency, sometimes our first in instinct is to grab our wallet, grab the laptop, grab the cell phone, and you're going to be thinking of all these things while at the same time their smoke, their alarms are going off. So why not pack your essential items of uh, travel, such as your passport, um, some cash, maybe credit cards, and certainly your really important medications into a little grab and go uh, bag. And so when you hear that siren, if you hear that siren, then you can grab this, don't get cluttered up with anything else, perhaps put in your smoke hood and head out back to, back to the deck. So really basic things. You, uh, you know, really want to just think about it before you go. And we've seen from history that people, once it's, there's smoke, once there's carbon monoxide, it's very, very short amount of time before you get debilitated. So just a bit of basic preparation will give you peace of mind before you uh, take that cruise that you've been waiting all the years to take. All right. Thanks for that. Um, moving on to our next question. What is the most significant, significant event that I, as a dive instructor, could face? that might expose me to a legal liability suit. Okay, this is the sport of the, uh, the current time that we're in, and that's legal liability suits. And the best way that we can avoid ending up in a situation that could be financially disastrous for us is never mind the accident, it's to have a well thought through, appropriate, well practiced emergency action plan. And for those of you that have read some of my articles and heard me speak before, you know that I'm really passionate about this particular aspect. It's because it's the accident or the incident that leads to the lawsuit. We only end up being um, taken to court because something went wrong and we weren't really adequately prepared for that event. Now we get medical emergencies, I think we're pretty used to those in diving, and then we get non-medical emergencies and we need to think through our situation very carefully before the time so this is our business. We need to think about what are the risks that we face when we uh, take folks diving, when we charter that boat, and consider that our divers might come with pre-existing health conditions so that you know, heart attacks and various other issues might befall those travelers. And then we know all about diving injuries. That tends to be you know, one of our main focuses. So we have illnesses and injuries. So we could have trauma. Typically what we've seen out there is the cylinder falling on somebody's foot or somebody having a propeller injury or something that sparked off our kind of major safety program and that is getting your finger caught in the diving ladder. Really as simple as that, but if it happens and somebody ends up with a crushed or amputated finger, that's pretty significant. And you know who they're going to blame for that particular issue. And of course, if we have a death on board, that requires very specific planning. It's not going to be a, an emergency in that you have to you know, rush around taking immediate action, but you need to know what it is that you're going to do. You don't want the next of kin um, coming back at you for not treating their, um, their be beloved one with, with respect. We have boat accidents, and some of these are relatively familiar to us. And as I said in the previous um, question about fires on board the boats is the US Coast Guard and other Coast Guards are pretty insistent that we have good emergency procedures, that we practice them and that we document them. And when they come on board to do the inspection, they're going to ask, where's your man overboard emergency procedure and show us proof that you've drilled that uh, frequently enough. Then we have fires and explosions, not only on the boat, but these can happen in the workshop, um, maybe in the accommodation that you're providing to your guests. So think a bit you know, a bit more than just the, the diving event. Um, and then something that I think is often misthought about or misunderstood or perhaps just disregarded, and that is the human interaction. So bad behavior, aggression that people might show towards you, perhaps some degree of civil disturbance. If you think of your guests taking a day trip on a, on a rented motorcycle or a, a vehicle being stopped at some roadblock, and the next thing you know, they've been arrested because they don't know what the protocols are. You need to have a plan in place. And if you look at everything that I've described so far, you can see very quickly where those, those lawsuits are gonna stem from. So, plan. Identify what those emergencies might be and put together a realistic emergency action plan, something that you can practice consistently, that you can carry out. It will be effective as far as you, know, you can plan for. We can't plan for every eventuality. But what happens if we have an emergency with a proper emergency action plan 
is that we can mitigate the situation, minimize the injury, minimize ongoing injuries, and ultimately show our guests and our staff that we are prepared as best as one can be prepared you know, for these things. Now, of course, and I'm not going to end up sparring with any of you learned uh, lawyers out there, but there are no guarantees. That much we have to accept. And when there are accidents, people usually want to blame someone. If you have a sound emergency action plan, you've practiced it, you've got documented proof that you've carried it out, that you've you know, done your best to foresee the um, you know, possible emergencies, and you follow that plan consistently, then perhaps the plan has some shortcomings, but you've done your best. There's documentation to provide to whoever is now bringing the suit, and you can argue about whether the plan was perfect or not, but at least you can show that you were prepared and you did as much as you can do before the situation actually uh, before the situation occurs, and hopefully it doesn't occur. You know, when we plan with these things and we think of these emergency situations, they tend not to happen. They happen when we are not planned for them. There's a, an article in one of the Alert Diver magazines, the first quarter of 2020, where I've explained a lot of this, and there's in fact a webinar specifically on putting together an emergency action plan that is designed to prompt you to think about the things that you might not normally think about. So, you know, that's really... What I've seen from the lawsuits, the, the cases, that's really where it all stems from. There's some bad luck. We can't really avoid that. But there's certainly um, something we can do to prepare ourselves for that. And that way, hopefully mitigate that wretched liability suit that never mind feeling bad about what's happened, you now have to you know, be concerned about yourself. Sure. All right, thanks. Uh, moving on to the next question. Are lithium-ion batteries really safe to use? I read about an incident where a cave diver suffered severe laceration to their leg when a lithium ion battery pack exploded underwater. Yeah, this is a topic of uh, much discussion these days, and in fact there's you know, speculation that has been the cause of some significant and catastrophic fires. And I think most of us have seen you know, YouTube clips of things burning in airports and it looks pretty impressive when it happens, and it can be really devastating too. So I'm going to focus this really on you know, the use of lithium-ion batteries in our scuba gear. So really what affects us as divers. Let me start with saying you treat things with respect and generally speaking, things are not going to go wrong. Now, it is possible to have an emergency with a lithium-ion battery as a result of a factory defect. So, you know, when there's contamination in the chemicals that they're using to make the electrolyte in the, in the, uh, the battery, it is possible for the thing to, let's say, self-ignite. Um, but we have billions of lithium-ion batteries out there in use every day, and the number of accidents is actually very, very few. I know they may be measured in the thousands, but when you're measuring against billions, they're actually uh, very few. It comes down to us as people, you know, it's really related to how we treat those batteries and some degree of knowledge about what it is that we're dealing with. So we start off with regular inspections. Be aware of any sign of distortion, overheating, bulges, leaks, um, anything that could indicate that those batteries, that battery pack is really in distress. And it's pretty obvious, you know, it's not something that just kind of comes out of the blue. Then look at the wiring, the connections to make sure that the batteries are really secure in their housing, because that again leads to poor connections, overheating, and from that we end up with a wire short circuiting and so on. And then if it's really, really hot when you're charging it, and I don't mean, you know, warm, I mean really hot that you just about burn your, your fingers, that's clearly not an acceptable situation. A good warning sign, please heed that warning sign. Secondly, just protect them from damage. So if they're going to be loose, you're going to handle them, make sure you don't drop them, <laughs> make sure you don't put them somewhere where they can be damaged, because mechanical damage, apart from, um, you know, let's say an intrinsic fault in the battery is probably one of the larger of the reasons that we just don't pay attention to these things. We've had so much use out of them that we become completely complacent. Then we come to the one that I think people need to take note of, and that's charging. Now, who of us hasn't bought a kind of really inexpensive charging cable or a plug-in charger that goes into our automobiles um, a cigarette lighter? For smaller consumers, in other words, cell phones and so on, perhaps less of an issue. But if it's your scooter or your underwater camera housing or the light housing, the original equipment manufacturer builds in safeguards into their charging devices, which means they won't overcharge the battery. It will switch off before the battery gets to, let's say, completely full. 
and that way it will prevent damage from overheating um, if you just leave it plugged in. And that's what we like to do, right, Brian? We plug in our laptop and we forget about it and days passed and the thing actually ends up, if you're not using the original charger being overheated. Once it's charged, remove it. And remember, our batteries work best when they are between 85, um, 75 to 85% charge. Now, a good manufacturer will fool you, the lights go green, you assume that it's charged, but actually it's about 85% charged. So we're not going to overcharge it. Again, using that inexpensive, let's say generic charger, we can often damage, especially the higher power devices. Please don't leave your, your thing overnight on charge, whether it's your laptop, your cell phone, and of course, I have to say that I think most of us have done that, so we, none of us are saints when it comes to that. And then the last part of this is don't let the battery run down completely. So when you finish using your lamp or whatever it is, then switch it off so that it then doesn't get to the point where when you recharge the battery, it draws a lot of current and of course a lot of heat and that's mm. where some of the damage can be done. And just be vigilant. If it looks like it's in distress, if it's hot, if it starts to smoke, then for heaven's sakes, you know, pull out the charger, unplug the charger and turn the device off. So that's what I can share with you, some really common sense stuff. Um, we've seen these things happen. They look pretty impressive when we have a fire and, and things are burning. But mm. generally speaking, you're not going to see that. And the case that you mentioned with the, the cave diver, that's pretty extreme. Mm. I don't want to speculate as to what happened. I've read some of the, the case history on that. But let's just say that we as human beings have a lot to answer for. Mm. All right, next question for you. Uh, we often read about the dangers of carbon monoxide poisoning when breathing from a cylinder. I know about motor vehicle exhaust fumes. What else can cause this? Okay. This is a good question, Brian, and it's been asked, obviously, of us. And let me kick off by saying motor vehicle exhausts. Actually, it's not such a major issue because these days modern vehicles are fitted with catalytic converters. And when a colleague and I went chasing fires in California um, a while back because we'd been asked these questions, you know, does the fire present a danger, some hazard to the, to the filling stations? Mm -hmm. We actually try to, let's say, calibrate our instrument by putting it right at the exhaust of our rented vehicle. And we picked up just about no carbon monoxide at all. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to talk about here is how do we still get carbon monoxide in our breathing gas? And we've had, these are fairly regular reports of people that you know, phone in, call into Dan, call into the medical hotline with headaches and other things that you know, are related to carbon monoxide poisoning, and we find you know, the elevated levels actually in the breathing gas. So I've divided this really into two, one not related to the compressor and the other one related to, um, to the compressor itself, which is by far the lesser of the two. So the first is thinking about where your compressor intake is located. And when you're doing that particular exercise, what you want to do is look for those non-obvious sources of carbon monoxide. And they can come from what we call incomplete uh, combustion, so heaters and dryers and other things that are burning gas, things in the kitchen, you know, perhaps overheating the oil, burning the oil, smokers, clearly when we are smoking our, uh, our barbecued meats on certain occasions. And then what I would like to say when I talk about fires, and I'm talking about fires on the outside now, for instance, forest fires and other things like that, is the carbon monoxide, by the time that sm you smell the smoke and it gets to us, the carbon monoxide has dissipated long before then. So, mm -hmm. you know, a fire that's happening you know, several hundred yards away is unlikely to be a major source of, of concern for you, but you need to be vigilant and look out for these things. More likely is going to be um, things like solvents, adhesive, paint strippers, gasoline, and anything else that gives off um, vapor. Mm. Maybe it's not only going to be carbon monoxide, but they're certainly capable of reacting with things and producing elevated levels of carbon monoxide. Another one that is perhaps even less from, you know, logical to some of us is rotting waste. So your kitchen waste that gets dumped um, in, the, in the trash cans outside. Um, you might have a bio, biomass pit somewhere. It gives off methane, it gives off carbon monoxide. And we certainly, you know, in our kind of walk around, that's what we look for. So here are a good couple of prompts for you to look at and then decide where to put your compressor intake to avoid um, drawing in those, those sources of carbon monoxide. So basically, you know, awareness, vigilance in case something happens. If you see something happening, then switch off the compressor and monitor and check whether the cylinders have been compromised or not. 
The second one, which is I think kind of the default, people tend to think it's the compressor that's caused the carbon monoxide in the first place. And yes, a poorly maintained compressor where the oil is broken down, where the compressor is running really hot because the fins have become um, you know, clogged up with dirt, they may indeed burn the oil. And if they burn the oil, again, it's what we call incomplete combustion, not very effective, efficient combustion. And carbon monoxide is one of those, one of those gases that are given off. And that's certainly not frequent, but we've heard reports, we've investigated them, and we get pretty elevated levels of carbon monoxide. But we can smell that. That's always my issue. You know, we talk about carbon monoxide as being that colorless, odorless, silent killer. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes out of compressor from oil that's been burned, generally there's going to be a fairly acrid smell that goes with that. If the, um, if the dive operator is not paying attention and they buy a filter element that doesn't have a carbon monoxide filter in it, it's a catalyst called hopcolite, then clearly if there is surrounding carbon monoxide, say we're on a boat and we're mm -hmm. running a combustion engine to drive the compressor, and there's no carbon monoxide filter element in the compressor filter system, that's, that's pretty hazardous. Also remember that this is not the coverall. A, a filter with a hopcolite in it is not going to be able to cope with really high levels of carbon monoxide. So if we have a diesel engine running and we get you know, large amounts of carbon monoxide drawn in, that hopcolite filter has a limit to how effective it is. So if you're getting above 50 to 100 parts per million, which is a low number, but very toxic for us, then a lot of it's gonna go through. And even worse, if we have not paid attention to our filters and the elements have become saturated, which often happens at our dive areas because we like to dive where it's warm and humid, then we can, again, limit the ability of that hop collide to catalyze out the carbon monoxide. So again, in terms of compressor operators, diligence. And in fact, if it's me and I'm board, on board a boat and they're running a diesel engine to, to drive the compressor, my first thing is to say, hang on a second over here, let me go and check where the intake is and to ask them, you know, do you guys diligently uh, check your air quality and do you replace your filters as you should? So just basic diligence. And then the kind of catch-all is to monitor and the dive shop can monitor, especially when they move the intakes or something changes in the, in the environment, preferably online monitor in, in, in real time. And then the diver can take along a inexpensive, portable, these days, you know, robust and accurate carbon monoxide monitor with them. And I know many folks that have actually started to do this, especially when they're traveling to more remote areas and, you know, one is a little bit more concerned about whether it's possible, you know, to get contamination, especially areas where there's no central electricity supply mm -hmm. and they rely on diesel generators and so on. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I see that here in the U.S., the safe limit for CO is 10 parts per million. In other countries, like many in Europe, it is 5 parts per million. Does this mean that the limit in the U.S. is... That's a good question. We get, I get asked that question, and we have some debate about it, but let's, let's just look at this in context um, so we don't overreact to this. So why is there this difference, and is it significant to us? And I kind of call this the U.S. versus the rest, because here in the U.S., we actually have the most lax limit for carbon, uh, for carbon monoxide. So our CGA grade E air that we use as our specification for testing has a limit of 10 parts per million. Okay, small number, but we, you know, we're concerned about carbon monoxide. In Canada, it's less than five, and in Europe, it's less than three. In some cases, it's even less than two parts per million. So why this big difference, you know, a factor of, of almost five in some cases? So let's start thinking about what are we concerned about. And the first thing is to understand that these limits are measured at the surface, meaning when we take a sample of the gas in our cylinder, these are the limits that we are going to comply with. So when they mm -hmm. do the air sample, they're going to be looking at this at the surface level. But remember, when we dive, for those of you that are technically minded, our interstage pressure from the first stage regulator increases. The deeper we dive, the more pressure we need to breathe in. Therefore, the more gas, the more number of molecules. So even a small number on the surface is going to increase as we dive down, um, you know, the deeper we go. And that's related to the depth. Essentially, if you have 10 parts per million at the surface, at 165 feet, which is six atmospheres, mm -hmm. you're breathing the equivalent of 60 parts per million. So we try to keep that number low, so when we're at depth, we don't exceed what are, you know, the safe limits. Ideally, we want to keep it below 60 parts per million. I mean, ideally, we want to have none. Right. Okay, that's the kind of the goal. 
But as you can see in this table here, 60 parts per million, the table values are really meant to be for longer time exposure, so not the, you know one hour of diving that we do. And if we go really deep, our diving time is actually even less than that. But 60, maybe to 75 parts per million at depth is the limit that we want to make sure that we don't exceed. So remember, that's a depth. Okay, so if you think about it this way, whether it's three or five or 10, it's not really so much about a number as why is it there? And the background carbon monoxide is generally going to be zero. It's about point something, you know, in terms of if you look around the world. But when it gets to one or two, it indicates there's a source. Now, maybe it's a spurious source, something passed you by and, you know, disappears down to zero again. But if it's one or two or three or four, it's indicating there's a source and you need to find that source and address it at source rather than waiting to see whether you pass, pass the air quality test or not. So. Very good. On to the next one. Uh, are the hyperbaric chambers located in or close to popular diving areas all safe to use? I know that some of them are meant for commercial diving, but does that mean it could be used to treat me? Yeah, now we're on to my pet subject. As you, when you introduced me, uh, you see that I've traveled around a little bit and seen these things. Let me tell you that they come in all sorts of uh, sh shapes and sizes and applications and variety of conditions. But the question that we as Dan need to know is, if we're going to refer a diver to a, to a recompression chamber, is it safe? Are they going to get a, a suitable treatment? Is it going to be a safe treatment? Are they going to get the desired um, result that they want? So as I say, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And bear in mind that in a remote area, they're not going to be treating that many people. It means they're not really going to be able to buy something absolutely dedicated to what we call recompression um, chambers. So yes, we will use decompression chambers, recompression chambers. One can go into the difference between those, but I don't really want to bore you with all mm -hmm. those details. But really any um, hyperbaric chamber that can go down to three atmospheres, or actually 2.8 is where mm -hmm. we like to be, is suitable. So whether it's a single person or a multi-place chamber, we can get a good treatment out of that. I know there's some kick back against what we call monoplace chambers, single person chambers, because we can't get in there to do something. But you can see from the picture at the bottom, that's a chamber that treats divers as well as other patients. Um, but we can get pretty sophisticated in the degree of life support that we can achieve in that. So that's kind of the first part, just telling you, yes, we can treat people in decompression chambers, recompression chambers, saturation chambers, pretty much everything. What I would like to add on to this is that we have something called the, the Dan RCN Recompression Chamber Network, and that's our database where we collate information about any chamber around the world that can treat a diver. So that if, you know, if, we, if we hear somebody's in an area and we have at least those details in our database, then we can start to make some decisions. And let me, before I even go any further, let me tell you that what we normally look for, Brian, is is there a well-trained doctor? Because a doctor can work miracles with any sort of chamber. If you don't have a doctor, then we start to get pretty nervous, you know, those of us here at Dan. So that's our database. We have a program called the Recompression Chamber Assistance Program, and that's, as Brian said, I've been out all, all the way around the world, about 150 different chambers um, that I've visited. And our primary task is to help these folks that don't have, you know, perhaps all the right equipment, but usually the practices and procedures and awareness and training. And these are things that we can certainly give to them. We don't provide equipment, but we provide on-site training and as much support as we can. Mm -hmm. But what we're really doing is we're providing our physicians or our referral doctors with some confidence that if they send that person to that chamber, they'll get a suitable treatment. Right. The key is the staff. And, you know, we always hear about, well, they've got a great chamber. And let me tell you, from my point of view, I'll go into a really basic chamber if I have faith in that, in that staff contingent. And I've been to some pretty fancy chambers, and you won't find me in those chambers. I mm -hmm. get petrified of being locked in there, and the staff are really not paying any attention. Let me just end this part by saying, don't worry about it too much, <laughs> in the sense that, sure, you might want to know, you know that there's a chamber in the area. But get yourself or be sent to a healthcare facility where you can be properly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Call Dan or have them call Dan. Mm -hmm. Firstly, it might not be DCI, so then you might end up being treated in a chamber for no good reason. Mm. And we have the details. Our database is kept up to date. We make sure we have all the contact details. We know whether they're operational. 
So give us a shout. We're the ones that can certainly give whoever's trying to refer that person mm -hmm. the information that we need. So yes, you probably want to know there's a chamber in the area, but please, you know, not all chambers are, are equal. And I think at Dan, we have a pretty good handle on where we can refer people to. That's right. And at the end of the day, we're only going to send people to a chamber that we truly trust. Yeah. All right, good. On to the next question. Uh, I have read blogs, scuba publications uh, during this COVID period about exploding scuba and oxygen. Are these really safe to use? And should I be doing something to ensure my own safety? Okay, the, the COVID thing, you know, that's kind of part of the question that comes up now is we've heard of so many ch um, cylinders exploding, um, mostly oxygen cylinders, but it's got nothing to do with diving. This is, you know, the shortage of oxygen supplies in many of these countries and people don't understand the, um, the energy that's stored in a cylinder. So, so let me just take you through a couple of things, try to answer the question for you as the diver that owns your own cylinders, as the dive operator filling station that is either filling or you know, providing, they have the cylinders filled somewhere, somewhere else and they provide them on a rental basis uh, to their clients. The first is to understand that Hey, these cylinders are designed properly by engineers, and I speak for my profession when I say that, because we bear in mind many things when we do these designs. We look at overpressurization, overheating, corrosion issues, pressure relief devices, and so on. So you really have to mess up to get a cylinder to explode. Yeah. Having said that, people tend to you know, kind of disregard um, the energy that's inside that cylinder. So they, they are pretty robust, and we have to kind of bring that human factor in to, to mess it up. So what can we do, whether you're the dive center, the chart operator, or the diver, is make sure that your cylinders are inspected and tested regularly. Remember that inspection and test is not going to make the, the cylinder any, any more robust. It's simply going to tell us in advance whether we're starting to get in an area where things are not looking as they should look. So they are important, and they're there. They're carefully designed in there. You follow those annual visual inspections and five yearly um, hydrostatic pressure tests, very unlikely you're going to end up with, with an issue. Mm -hmm. The second is to handle them with respect. Now, let me teach you something about respect. <laughs> the amount of energy that is stored inside a cylinder, if it were to rupture catastrophically, is about the same as a three-ton imperial ton <laughs> truck traveling at 70 miles an hour. With that kinetic energy, that truck traveling at that speed, equates to the amount of energy that's inside that cylinder if it were to rupture catastrophically. So let's treat these things with respect because there's more in it than, um, than we sometimes think. So some common, thing, common sense things to think about. We throw them in the back of our vehicle, secure them that they don't roll around. If you hit your brakes, they're not going to move to the front of the vehicle and you know, get stressed on their valves. Keep them out of the sun when they're full. You know, we're gonna heat them up, especially aluminum cylinders. They tend to be more susceptible to heat and under pressure with heat for long-term exposure, it is possible to start to, uh, to soften the material, which we picked up during the hydro test. So even if it does happen once or twice, we could catch it. But if you continuously leave these cylinders in the sun when they're full, you could end up with an issue. And we've certainly seen that as being the primary cause of some of these catastrophic um, explosions and failures. When it's not in use, the cylinder's not in use, it needs to be secured. So, you know, I've been into the garage of some of our colleague divers out there and you see this whole row of scuba cylinders against the side of the wall in the garage and the vehicle drives in and out of the garage and you know, the car door could quite easily knock over a cylinder. That's not a good practice. So you want to store it somewhere where it can't easily be knocked over, just out of the way, you know, somewhere where it's secure. We do get asked the question, should I store it standing up, which is kind of more hazardous because it could be knocked over, or should I lie it down so that if somebody bumps it, it's going to roll perhaps, but it's not going to you know, fall over. Mm -hmm. The answer to the question um, really lies with the design. So we designed the base of the cylinder to, so that's where we expect the water to accumulate, to be thicker than the walls for corrosion purposes. So if you lie it on its side and there's moisture in there, it's going to corrode slowly as it is on the wall, which is thin. If you stand it up, the corrosion will be where it's thickest and you know, least likely to end up with a failure. So according to CGA um, P5, which is a, 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 actually a standard that talks about high pressure cylinders or underwater scuba applications, mm -hmm. so that's, that's us. It suggests or recommends that we um, store them you know, upright, standing on their bases. Mm -hmm. 
So a basic understanding of the amount of energy um, that's in there is really the key to, to all of this. Of course, they do explode, and sometimes it's just really bad luck. You know, there's a fire or it drops from a height because of things outside of our control. But it's really, there's going to be gross negligence. And, you know, each time we hear of one of these explosions, we, we get to hear of them, you know, maybe at the moment, once or twice a month. It's crazy what people do. You know, hey, we've been on dive boats where the, the dive operators are throwing the cylinders at each other to load up the boat when they, uh, you know, they need to get out of there. You throwing around a three-ton vehicle at 70 miles an hour, I don't want to be around when that thing misses the hands of the, of the guy on, on the boat. So dive operators, yes, I do have a bit of a thing in the way that cylinders are sometimes handled. So just, you know, be aware of it. They are safe. When they explode, there's normally a very good reason and usually gross negligence. All right. All right, well, that brings us to the end of the questions that we came prepared with. But, of course, we uh, expect that some of you have brought some of your own. I see we do already have one in the chat. Uh, but before we get there, I want to acknowledge what uh, Francois just put up on, on his screen. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. And thank you especially to Dan members, without whom we would not be able to do this sort of educational outreach. We greatly appreciate your support. Um, great. Well, shall we move into the Q&A portion? Yep. Catch me out if uh, you can. All right. Let's see. Um, so uh, one that I see here in the chat is, I'm traveling to a remote area to go diving. Having watched your webinar on emergency planning, please can you help me focus on the most important things that I should consider before leaving? Okay, so let me kick off with by saying congratulations. It's a, it's a great question. It means that you've, you know, you've listened to what, uh, what we try to encourage you to listen to, and you're going prepared, which is you know, not only going to stand you in good stead, but it's good preparation. You'll think about things and most likely have a lesser chance of, of mm -hmm. in, ending up in an emergency. So I guess you can divide this into three things, Brian. Mm -hmm. The first is taking along with you the telephone numbers, the contact details that you need. Mm -hmm. you know, it might be somebody, should be somebody back at home that can come to your rescue to some extent your dive buddies, the dive shop, the accommodation, and I'm just thinking ahead now, probably, it depends where you go to. If you're going down to the Keys, we have great emergency uh, services there. You go mm -hmm. to some of the islands, they might be a lot more restricted. Mm -hmm. And remember, on some of these remote areas, um, we don't have telephones that work. You know, cell phones don't work in every place. And, you know, telephones these days are really not reliable. And there's no internet, so you can't go online and get hold of your travel agent and tell them that they need to kind of reschedule uh, where you're going to. So that, that's probably the, the, the most important part is to, you know, make sure that you can contact somebody, you know, before, you, you know, if you end up in a situation. I've been in that situation where they stole my, my luggage, my mm -hmm. computer bag, I lost my passport, my money. And you kind of think to yourself, well, what's the first thing you do? Now, having come from the business side of things, the first thing I did was called my business partner and told her to cancel my credit cards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything else I could live with that. Right. But speaking of that, you probably want to carry with you, you know, copies of your passports, your essential documents, put mm -hmm. perhaps somewhere else, maybe a spare credit card or two, um, so that if something is stolen, then you have a way to kind of start the remedial process. And if you're going to some really remote place, perhaps consider finding out where the, uh, the nearest consular agent is. Uh, again, that happened to me. My passport was stolen. I was in a foreign country. I needed to get home. And um, fortunately, I had my computer and the internet, and I could, um, not my computer, the hotel's computer, mine was gone, mm -hmm. find the local consular agent and start the process of you know, getting myself back home again. So those are probably two of the most important things, thinking about when you go to a remote area. And just before going to the next question. Mm -hmm. um, if you have underlying health issues, um, clearly you're going to take your medication with you, but be aware that in some of these remote areas you might not be able to get replacement medication, so take enough stuff with you. And maybe their medical care facilities are not going to be able to cope with something that you might go through because of your underlying issues. So mm -hmm. probably you want to do a bit of homework and check that they can you know, provide you the support if you need it. All right. Um, next question in the chat. Uh, Dan published a series of articles on braided hoses over the past few years. How has the dive industry responded to that? Okay, 
So we, we did, we published a series of articles and actually the whole issue started with a colleague, a friend of mine that had had an underwater experience where her breathing hose actually uh, blocked. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, she could, you know, get her octo and she could complete the dive and get back safely. So we published the first article and we were a little bit in the dark as to what the cause was. We could clearly see what it looked like and um, one of the readers, um, a professor at a university, was very interested in this and did some what you call accelerated testing and aging or degen degeneration testing. Mm. And we discovered that it had to do with the material that the hoses were made from. So once we published that and we invited uh, divers to send us the, the pictures of their hoses, um, we could see that it's actually, and still to this day, we get reports. Now, the pictures are great, and I've got a great library of what these things look like. The manufacturers have addressed the issue. We know that these date back to 2008, 2009. Many of us tend to think that our dive gear lasts forever. It doesn't. Mm. And, you know, hoses are pretty robust, but braided hoses perhaps need a little bit more care. So five years is probably a good time for a braided hose. So 2008 to 2021, probably yeah. time to replace it. But you know, the most rewarding part of, of all of this, Brian, is the fact that we've had people call in and say, you know, and this is the truth, I was going diving, I tested my regulator on the surface, it wasn't quite right, and then I remembered, Dan wrote an article on this, and what did I do? I took hold of my hose, and I bent it over, and what did I find? A nice soft spot in the middle of the hose. And we prevented an accident from happening. We've had other cases where they go diving, they have an air out, they come to the surface, and they kick themselves for not actually checking before they go. So I think it's been a great a sharing of safety information with the industry, real stuff, divers that face these issues. And you know, you can, you can do your own basic inspections and prevent yourself from ending up in a, in a poor situation. And not just of hoses, like of a lot of All your equipment, gear, right? yeah. correct. Yeah, even if you're not a certified you know, gear maintenance professional, you can still do the once over. You know, check it out yourself, and it's a good idea to do so. All right, another question here in the chat. Uh, with all the concern and sometimes mixed messages about COVID-19 transmission, can I assume that if I've been fully vaccinated, I'm safe from getting ill from shared or rented dive gear? That's a, that's a tough one. I'll leave that to the epidemiologists and the scientists to tell you what the chance is of you actually getting COVID from you know, some shared um, mask or piece of equipment. But let me, let me tell you what you should be doing. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we talk about infection control, meaning controlling how we could get an infection, cleaning things properly. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll hear us talk about sterilizing and disinfecting and sanitizing and a whole bunch of terms. One of those terms is called cleaning. So, and let's think now beyond COVID too. COVID is not the only thing you can pick up from shared diving gear. I mean, you can pick up all sorts of bacterial issues, fungus issues, and so on. So when we do share equipment, vaccinated or not, the lessons from COVID or the, the focus that COVID has brought to us is that we should be practicing infection control regardless of, of, of COVID itself. So mm -hmm. yes, if you've been vaccinated, your chance of getting infected is less, but it doesn't diminish, diminish the role you have in taking care of yourself for other things. COVID is actually, the virus is a very weak virus, so it tends to be um, inactivated by you know relatively mild disinfectants. So, Kind of the, the lesson, I think one of the takeaway lessons from this has been shared rinsing buckets. So mm -hmm. if it was me, I would say if you want to have a shared disinfecting bucket with some proper disinfectant in there, that should be fine, you know, as long as it's changed frequency, mm -hmm. frequently. But you probably want to rinse out your, your mask and your stuff in the sea or somewhere that's not a shared, um, you know, shared water. And if it were me and I was going diving somewhere in COVID at the moment, um, and it's rental equipment, I probably want to quiz the, the, the dive shop and see, you know, do you disinfect? And these days they're great. Most of them have kind of come mm -hmm. to the party and they disinfect their gear. But just ask them and then take the normal care, make sure the stuff is kept clean. Cleaning is the most effective way mm. of making sure that things are not transmitted. And we've heard that with, with COVID, wash your hands regularly with soap and water. It's a great way to get rid of the, uh, the little guys that do so much harm. Right, and a lot of the, the washing is more about that mechanical scrubbing action, or yeah. as much about it, maybe. Yes. In fact, the most effective way to disinfect mm -hmm. is to wash it with soap and water mechanically to get rid of anything that's, you know, kind of significant in terms of amounts of, of whatever the matter happens to be. Mm -hmm. And then the disinfectant has the best chance of actually getting in touch with the virus particles and actually um, inactivating them. Okay. Whereas if you've got a whole bunch of gunk on there, mm -hmm. 
whether it's saliva or mucus or whatever else, if you don't mechanically clean it, the disinfectant's just going to see the surface and not really, you know, get into, into where that horrible little fellow is actually sitting. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. That is the last of the questions I see here in the chat. So um, They're going easy on me, bro. Indeed, indeed. So if anyone else has a question, get it in quick, um, or we will wrap it up. All right. It looks like that's probably the end of it. So Would you just like to give them our contact details? So yes, yes. If so they're shy of asking you asked. Yes, yeah, so if you do have any questions that occur to you later after this presentation, we would encourage you to reach out and email us at riskmitigation at dan.org. And that's the email address that a lot of these questions came into originally. That's how we uh, came to put this presentation together for you. And we would really be glad to have our safety services department uh, field your risk mitigation questions. Please don't hesitate to contact us. Once again, that email address is riskmitigation at dan.org. And once again, we want to thank every one of you for being here this afternoon. Uh, please do know that you can watch this presentation later on dan.org, uh, the events page, or on Dan's YouTube channel. So please, if you uh, found this valuable, share it with uh, other divers you know. And um, Let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, one more question, shall we? Of course. All right. Uh, in a recent alert diver, you talked about the quarter turn of a valve, how that is uh, fallen out of favor. Uh, is this still an issue in the industry, and is it a cause of accident? Okay. So the, when they say the quarter turn issue, it means fully open back a quarter of a turn. Now, right. they, they kind the, of the, the traditional means that a yeah, lot of us were taught. kind of two schools of thought. I'm old fashioned. Okay. And, uh, and a lot of work in the gas industry. And if you don't know the difference between opening and closing a valve, and you're about to rely, your entire existence is reliant on the gas coming out of the cylinder, perhaps you should pick another sport. So you should know which is open and which is closed. And there, there are many parts of the argument. You know, some people will say, fully open, then I know it's open. Some might say, you know, if it's fully open, you open it too tightly, then you really don't know whether it's open or closed. And mm -hmm. if you suddenly have to, you know, if you have to turn off your valve in an emergency, it might be difficult to do because you now you know, get stuck. Mm -hmm. And in the old days with some of our older technology, valves really didn't like to be over tightened when they, when they um, fully open mm -hmm. because it damaged the back seat and you know, you'd start to get leak in the valve, mm -hmm. which means you then have to tighten when you close well, it. Tighten and that's it more. where the idea of the quarter turn originally yeah, came from? Yeah, so it's from? keeping no stress on mm -hmm. the back seal, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the packing seal of the actual valve, which that's how I die. Sure. Okay? I, take, I turn it back. But the, the, the common um, way of doing it, the certification training agencies will tell you is um, just make sure it's open. So mm -hmm. We've designed the valves pretty robustly these days so they don't normally get damaged. Mm -hmm. So make sure it's open fully and test it, please, before mm -hmm. you, you know, jump, jump into the water. Put the mask in your DV in your mouth, take a breath, look at your gauge, make mm -hmm. sure the needle doesn't move, mm -hmm. and that's your ultimate check. So mm -hmm. we're going to have two schools of thought, and we've, from that article, picked up some pretty forceful um, folks coming back saying well, the one is right, the other is not right. Essentially, as long as you know <laughs> what is open or what is closed, and you're confident that your valve is fully open so that you're not going to have any restriction to flow, then either way really is going to work. If you're one of those folks that rather other people do it for you, then let them make sure it's fully open um, and you know that if you know your left from your right, mm. then you should be good. So there's no straightforward answer, but I've kind of given you the background as to why there's debate about this. Okay. Great. All right. Well, it looks like that is uh, all for the questions. And once again, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Dan members for your support. And uh, we hope to uh, connect with you in another upcoming webinar soon. In fact, we have one next week, a uh, week from today. That's uh, Thursday the 22nd. Uh, we will be talking about lobster mini season and safe harvesting of lobsters. So if you or someone you know is participating in the uh, Florida lobster mini season event uh, in two weeks from now, two weeks from yesterday, I believe, then please join us one week from today to uh, learn a little bit more about how to be safe when you do so. In addition, we'll have our regular monthly webinar coming up on August 19th. We hope you'll join us for that as well. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Thank you.